hello, and this is uh, the Digital Signature Podcast. And today, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, I'm here with uh, Adam Zucker, and if you haven't met Adam yet, uh, you can learn more about him uh, in our conversation up on the main podcast uh, website on digitalsignature.fm. Uh, but today, uh, we're actually going to explore an activity related to that conversation that uh, Adam very kindly uh, prepared for us. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to walk through it with you uh, and with uh, Adam today. So uh, Adam, hello again, and uh, thanks again for being back with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you too. Um, so I'm actually going to share my screen. And I have my, my browser open here. Uh, and this is the website, uh, the, the Digital Signature Podcast uh, website, and uh, where all of our conversations will be. Uh, you're all at home living in the future, so this won't say coming soon anymore, but uh, that's where you'll find us. Uh, but uh, actually, if we scroll down here a little bit, there's a whole bunch of fun little activities you can do at home or at school. Uh, and uh, Adam has created uh, this one for us here on uh, classifying uh, legitimate text with natural language processing. We talked a lot about uh, natural language processing or NLP. And uh, this is an activity that uh, is going to kind of just let us get a little taste of uh, what that's all about. So, um, Adam, let me uh, not try to explain to folks what this is because you made it. Uh, so, do you want to tell us a little bit about what are we doing today? Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the fundamental tasks in NLP wow. is text classification. We see this everywhere. Your email spam filter, determining whether something an email is spam or not, um, determining what category a text belongs to if it but you know if it belongs to like what topic politics science etc so here i thought something that would be relevant for students is being able to predict whether or not a job posting is fraudulent or not because you, we don't want to waste our time we want to make sure we are applying to legitimate jobs so we can use nlp here to train a model that's able to predict that for us take that um sort of decision making out of our hands, which is what machine learning is designed to do. And NLP is, of course, a subfield of machine learning. So, yeah. That sounds great. Well, yeah, thanks for doing that. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, let's take a look here. Uh, there's actually some some pretty nice description uh, that kind of summarizes what, what you just told us. Uh, so if you're at home, you can uh, read that over. But uh, I'm going to dive in and kind of walk through it uh, today. and. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, Adam, you'll be able to help me do this. Uh, so um, I know that uh, one of the first steps we're going to do is we're going to use a free tool. Um, it's always nice when things are free uh, called uh, Google Colab. Uh, it's a collaborative programming environment um, where you can create these things called notebooks. Um, and uh, so Adam created for us a notebook. Uh, and what a notebook is, it's kind of like a, a program. You can put code in there, uh, but you can kind of break it up into sections. Uh, I think one of the hard parts about uh, when you're learning to program uh, is that a lot of times I think we try to, and I think as professionals, we do this too. We try to bite off everything at once because you have one file or, you know, maybe you have a, uh, you know, if you did good software engineering, you have a lot of files, but then, then you're like solving that thing. And um, what I like about these notebooks is that they, they can kind of break it down into what am I doing right now? Like, what's the first step that I want to do? It's a really nice environment for, um, for prototyping and just kind of hacking up a, a quick solution to give you an idea about how things work. I think it's a perfect environment for, for what we're doing here today. And so uh, I went ahead and opened up, uh, and here's the link. I just went to this link right here on uh, Google Colab, um, and it talks a little bit about how to open uh, a notebook. Uh, now, I, I happen to know how to do it, so I'm going to uh, walk you right on through it. And when you go to Colab, uh, which is uh, colab.research.google.com, uh, you'll be presented with this uh, box right here, this window here. And uh, you can open a notebook from a lot of different places. It'll actually save it to your account so you can, you can have your own. Uh, but in this case, we're gonna open one from the internet. Uh, That's another nice thing about uh, collaborative code is that we can host code on repositories like uh, GitHub, uh, which is a website for, uh, for hosting code projects that we can share with each other and build on. Um, in fact, our website is actually built uh, within GitHub so that other people can uh, make suggestions and make revisions and, and we can incorporate each other's work and basically all work together. Um, so I think that's a great idea. Um, and actually, uh, since uh, Adam created this notebook and put it on his GitHub account, uh, we can actually open it uh, from his GitHub account. So what I'm going to do here is click GitHub. 
And I'm going to type in uh, Adam's uh, username. That's my username there is uh, BillJR99. But I'm going to type in a sucker 99 which I think is right. I did. I got it right. Uh, and um, that is on the uh, web page if, you, uh, uh, if you, uh, you don't have to remember that. Um, but it'll give you a couple of choices. And I'm going to pick the one that is uh, NLP demo. That's the one we're doing today. Uh, it might ask you about a branch. You can just let it be main. That should be what's already there. Um, and, uh, and sure enough, there's our file, it's uh, nlpdemo.ipynb, just a fancy way of saying uh, an interactive Python notebook, uh, ipynb. And so we will click on that. And uh, here it comes. And uh, here's what a basic notebook looks like. And look what uh, Adam has done for us. Um, he's uh, broken up everything, not only into little chunks of code. So every little step, yeah, we're going to solve a big problem, but we're just going to do one little bite-sized nugget at a time and get to know how everything works. So um, you don't have to have a big programming background here. Uh, you don't have to certainly have a big NLP background here to be able to kind of just dive in and explore and see what things do. You can just turn the wheels and hit the buttons and get a sense of uh, what this stuff is all about. Um, and I also like that uh, he gave us these sections over here so we can kind of see the five, six, seven, actually there's uh, what about uh, seven basic steps here uh, that we're gonna be doing uh, today. And we're gonna walk through that quickly um, so that uh, if, you, if you'd like a walkthrough when you try this out at, uh, at school or at home, uh, you have an idea of what things should look like. So um, so uh, Adam, let me, let me turn it back over to you. and. Um, why don't you talk me through uh, what's what's going on here? Where do I start? Yeah, so this notebook, it really tries to model the data science uh, life cycle in a in a minute in a bite-sized format. Obviously, we can't get into everything because a lot of these sections could be weeks of work on end, exploring the data, preparing for training, training the model. It it really tries to encapsulate all of those. Um, components of the data science workflow in one nice notebook. And notebooks are ubiquitous in data science work. So starting with this first section, it's making sure we have everything we need. The first thing we need is a complete notebook. So you can see in that first cell, um, you see those characters at the beginning of both lines, the, the percent sign and the um, exclamation point. Those allow us to run what are known as uh, shell commands. It's really, uh, um, and Dr. Mangan, if you can maybe explain, talk to this point too, um, it's code that like lets you interact with um, your computer more directly than what you would get from a programming language. These things come installed with your computer. So right now we are just, um, downloading the repo, making sure you have all the available files. So that's what that first cell does. And in that second cell, we're, well, we're, we're switching to the project directory. So that becomes our active directory um, and allows us to run the code cells as is. I think I see. So you have this, um, you have some files uh, up on your repository, your, your GitHub project where this notebook lives. Um, that, that are going to help us. I, I imagine we're doing natural language processing. I'm, I'm betting there it's text uh, that we're going to be reading. Um, and so uh, this notebook is going to download those files uh, by doing something called cloning the repository. And uh, uh, you know what's nice here is that you don't have to necessarily know all that lingo yet because uh, since you packaged that up so nicely, we can just say, hey, let's go get it. And uh, I hit the run button and it might say, uh, just so you know, you're downloading files that uh, someone on the internet made, and it is a good idea to stop and think about that before you do it. But uh, in this case, I, I know Adam very well, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit, uh, yes, go ahead and run anyway. Um, and it's going to go ahead and download all those files into my notebook, and I can see some things happening here. Uh, basically, it's a little progress uh, of downloading those files. That's it. And, um, and we actually downloaded those into a folder uh, called a directory, and we named that directory NLP demo. Eh, just that way, we didn't have a bunch of files all over the notebook, and we, we packed them all into a nice, neat folder. Um, this next uh, box here uh, uh, tells us to basically open that folder. We're going to be looking and working with text in that folder. So we'll run that as well and see earlier it said it couldn't find it and now it's there because we just downloaded it. So that's perfectly normal. In fact, if you see an error here, uh, that's probably okay. It just means you, you just haven't done this first thing yet and those files weren't there and now they are. So that's wonderful. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I hit two buttons. I think we've done step one. So uh, what's next? 
Well, first we can validate that we did download the folder. If you click on that folder icon to the left of the uh, screen, you Maybe. should now see NLP demo. Oh, yep, yeah. there it is. Yeah, I wish I had done that first so you could see that it wasn't there, uh, but I bet it wasn't uh, and uh, very good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and that second so we ran puts us in there. So we have, we are on the same level as all of those other files. So we're in that NLP demo IPNY right now. So so we so we're there and we have all the data resources that we need because we pulled the repo. So now we can go down and we can uh, go about installing the required libraries and getting anything else we may need to run the cells in this notebook. Okay. So you can see in that third cell we use um, there's a couple things going on there. We have PIP, which is we're using the Python programming language. So PIP is what's known as a package manager. So it lets us download libraries that um, Python doesn't come with by default. And we it's installing these libraries that are written in that requirements.txt file that you see on the left. So in that file, and you can probably click it and we can see what kind of libraries um, are needed for this notebook. So you can see that we need Spacey for one, and we'll go a little bit more to what Spacey is, but Spacey is the library we're gonna be using for NLP. And these other libraries that you see here are kind of the go-to libraries for um, data science, machine learning in general for data analysis. So after we downloaded, installed those libraries, and it's nice, well, the one nice thing about Colab is it provisions a virtual environment for us, which is something you should take into account if you're gonna be doing, um, have, run, doing multiple projects on your computer. Mm -hmm. One thing that you'll notice about um, these libraries are sometimes you need to specify specific versions. So by having a virtual environment, you don't need to worry about having conflicting versions if you have if you're doing different projects that require different versions of libraries. Nice. So that's a nice thing that Colab handles for us. So that cell right below where we install all of our libraries, we can now put them to use. We need to import them in um, and tell Python to be able to use these libraries. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I, so I guess uh, having a virtual environment is it's kind of like uh, Google is setting up a computer for you to run all this stuff. And it's not going to be... Um, you know, it's not going to be kind of bogged down by all the other software that you might have installed on your computer. Um, and I'm a teacher, of course, and, and, and so I know how, how frightening it can be to say, well, all right, I need to install, you know, Python and these other pieces of software. And I hope I did it the same way on all 30 computers so that I don't have 30 different problems uh, when uh, people sit down and, and run them. It's a, it's a tricky problem to get them all just the same. And uh, uh, I think that's, uh, that's exactly what's happening here. And that's, a, that's just a great idea. Uh, before I move on, I did get a notice here that um, looks like I installed a couple of new packages that weren't on here before, and it wants me to restart. Uh, should I do that? I'm thinking I should. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion to follow. Sounds good to me. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the button then. We'll say restart. And it's just going to kind of reload the machine. And, you know, one thing I'm wondering is, does it does it remember that I downloaded everything? I, I wonder. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I'm going to hit the buttons anyway, uh, just to make doubly sure. But I bet you might be able to skip these because I can see the files are still there. So yeah, uh, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, and uh, so I think I restarted. Um, let me just make doubly sure that I did. Um, yes, in fact, you can see up here it said restarting and uh, now it's all back up. I'm just going to run to the top and just uh, real quick run these again. It says it's already up to date. I, I bet I didn't have to do that at all. So uh, that's great. I, I, I know I can skip this step here about installing requirements because I can see I've already done that. I think that puts me here on these, uh, these imports. So what's happening here? Yeah, so these are the libraries that we need to be able to conduct our um, demonstration in this notebook. And since they don't come standard with Python, we have to bring them in externally, which is why we have those import statements. Um, and you can see a little bit about the syntax themselves, like import pandas as PD. That allows us to shorten the names. So Python will still know PD refers to pandas. It just saves us some typing. Right, that's nice. Yeah. So moving on next, the first thing we need to do is look at the data set itself. So we're going to use a library called Pandas that is really the go-to library for data analysis. So we have this CSV file. You can think of that as like an Excel um, spreadsheet where it has all of our data about these fraudulent job postings. So the first thing we want to do is load that into what's known as a data frame object, which you can also think about as a spreadsheet. 
And then we're going to go about our exploratory data analysis, which is getting a sense of what the data actually looks like yeah, and you know, what we're really working with. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just, but I was thinking to myself, oh, I wonder if I should open that that CSV file that so that everybody could see what it looks like. But you know what? Uh, no, because we're going to tell the program to show it to us, aren't we? Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. You you were reading my mind. Yeah. So the first thing I always like to do is get a sense of the shape of the data. How many rows and how many columns are there? So you can see that if you run that cell, that it prints out first. And then also getting a sense of what the first couple rows of the data set actually look like, the data frame actually looks like. So you can see all the different columns that we have. And if you scroll all the way to the right on that data frame, if it has a scroll bar, nice. you're going to see what we're really concerned about, which is whether or not this job posting is fraudulent, fraudulent being represented by a one and um, a, a legitimate job posting being represented by a zero. So that's really what we're trying to classify, whether or not a job posting is a one or a zero, is fraudulent or is, or is legitimate. So we can see a little bit of the data here. Um, we can even go a little bit further and actually start to um, see individual cells. If you scroll down a little bit, I think that next cell shows you the syntax for accessing a specific uh, cell in, or accessing a specific, yeah, cell in the data frame. Okay. Well, actually, I yeah. uh, I, I'll, I'll just throw in real quick. I can see already this is, uh, this is gonna be helpful that we're writing a program for this because uh, I think that this is 17,000 of these examples and there's no way that a human could read through these and, and figure that out for themselves, uh, certainly you might find some patterns in there somewhere that say, this is real and this is fake. And uh, uh, maybe you know some examples already. And I, I guess that's what's happening over here. You can tell it, I know these are good or I know these are fraudulent. Uh, and uh, and now we're gonna see if, if we look at tens of thousands of those examples, can we start to find some patterns? So um, so right off the bat, I can see that uh, you know this is gonna give us some, some nice capabilities at big, big scale that uh, uh, we, we couldn't just as humans find those patterns ourselves. So uh, anyway, I just thought that was kind of exciting, but uh, yeah, go on, let me not uh, hold you up there. Uh, I'm down here with that, uh, that first record, I think. One nice thing, the point about what you said though is, yeah, that would be a lot for humans to do, but at the same time, I think with uh, the nice thing about humans and our learning process is we really don't need that many examples to learn something mm -hmm. like learning what kind of what like a picture of a cat looks like. We probably only need one or two pictures, but for a computer, you do need a, on a, as much data as really you can get to, mm -hmm. for it to really learn. So I think that's a neat difference. Yeah, it'll take right. us a while to go through all those, but we can get learn a little bit faster than a computer can. Yeah, I, I wonder if it's, you know, the humans can see so many different things at the same time when they look at a picture, uh, but a computer has to do one thing at a time. And so we, we have these 18 columns and we kind of have to learn the patterns one column at a time. And uh, we don't have that, that sort of human complex brain processing uh, to be able to just instantly synthesize those ideas together. Uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting point. And uh, um, of course, there are some fields in machine learning, uh, like artificial neural networks that actually try to capture some of those brain processes that humans have. And uh, uh, so it would be really interesting to have somebody on to, to talk to us about uh, our own physiology and how that, how that kind of uh, influences the way that computers try to quote unquote, because they're not really learning, but find yeah. patterns in ways that we call learning. And that's a really good point. I'm glad you said it. Definitely. That was a, yeah, it is, it is a really interesting thing to think about. But for our purposes right now, we can focus on, yeah, what we got here. Mm -hmm. So in one of the most important things is understanding that real life is a little bit messy. Um, data sets aren't always collected cleanly, meaning you might not have a value for every, um, for every cell, like for every, um, like, uh, thing that you see there. So you can see the thing we're checking for is missing values. So those numbers on the right are the number of missing values in each of the columns. So you can see for some of them, there are a lot of missing values. No one wants to say their salary range. It looks like almost, not, almost none of them, right? You know, I yeah. wanted to ask you about that because I saw some things up here like these NANs. Uh, what, what, what are, are those the missing values? Yeah, those are a missing values. So that stands for uh, n not a number. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah. So it's really how Python represents missing values. 
or cool. th yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be a lot easier to learn on title or description than it's going to be to learn on salary range because so few of them have it. Uh, although it'd be interesting if if the only ones that posted salary ranges were fraudulent, uh, then then maybe that's you know it's like too good to be true or something. Uh, you know, but uh, I, I would think that that might be a that might be a uh, uh, kind of a false uh, indicator. That's probably not the case in general, right? So, um, so in a way, we we also have to be a little bit careful there, right? That uh, we don't accidentally find patterns that that aren't really there. Uh, maybe that's the benefit of having thousands and thousands and thousands of examples. Definitely. And another thing too to consider when we have these um, missing values is what we should do with them. There's a lot of different techniques um, called imputation about how to handle missing values. A, a lot of the times you're going to have to think, it, would it be best just to drop those values or can we um, replace them, impute them with something else, either what well, the mean of the date of the column or you know, the median, there's a lot of different techniques we can use to handle missing data, maybe too many to go into in this notebook. And as you'll see, it won't be necessary, but that's another thing to think about. How should we handle missing data? Yeah, it's a good point. Like the median probably doesn't make sense for salary range, but for other things it might, uh, you know, if it's, uh, uh, you know, if it's measuring some physical property of something and it's just missing one in the middle, then, you know, it's between these two. So, man, eh, you can kind of get close enough. But on the other hand, for salary, like you might know that not having a value might actually be informative. That might tell you something, too. So, um, yeah, I guess there's some uh, there's some analytical thinking there, some critical reasoning that uh, the human touch uh, that comes into play here to figure out uh, what to do about this, how to make the right judgment call. Um, and I, I imagine some of that's experimental, too, and you, you see how it, how it does and you try different things. Um, so uh, yeah, that's 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 really interesting. Yeah, it is. So going a little bit further, um, yeah. that's that one cell. It's just uh, like how can we access a specific cell within oh, the data okay. frame? Right. Yeah. So the first record is zero. The first row and the name of the column. I bet I'm going to check is probably company uh, profile. Let's see. There it is. Yep, right yeah. there. And oh yeah, there's uh, we're food fifty two. That's it. Um, so it gets the first row, row zero, and then this column looks good. Yeah. And now another important part of data science is visualization. It, it's not always easy to just look at tables and try to derive meaning from it. Sometimes we need to see visually. Humans are very visual, so we like to see graphs and charts. So I made a simple chart of saying, class seeing how many job postings are actually fraudulent compared to non-fraudulent. And I think it's very evident um, that there's an imbalance here, that there are a lot more legitimate job postings than there are fraudulent job postings. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so when I said examples, there were, yeah, there were 18,000 of them, but 17,000 of those, I guess, were not actually fraudulent. So uh, is that going to be a problem? I think it's it might be. It might present an issue because, like I said, like, machine learning models, they need a lot of examples to learn. So if you're really showing at one class, it's going to develop a little bit of a bias towards predicting that class, because it's not going to see, have seen enough examples of the other class, the, we would say like minority class to be able to make a good distinction, whether or not it is actually, you know, fraudulent. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, it's I, I'm looking at this and it, it's surprisingly readable. Uh, you, you know, folks at home may not know what a lambda is, but I think that's OK. Um, what's happening here is we're grouping this data based on whether that column on the right was fraudulent or not fraudulent. So we're we're looking at the number. If, if X is zero, uh, then we'll call it uh, not fraudulent. And if X is anything but zero, we'll call it fraudulent. So we're giving a name to the number. Uh, if we look back at the data, I think we saw that fraudulent was always zero and one. And you probably could have just left it that way, but um, I think it's an awful lot nicer to convert that. And I think that's what you're doing here uh, is you're translating that zero to this and one to this. And uh, uh, that's gonna give us these labels here. So we get a nice human visualization uh, for what we're calling a horizontal bar chart, the bar H. Uh, computers love to uh, abbreviate things, but uh, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's fairly readable. And we label the X axis label the y-axis and uh, that, that looks great. So yeah, this is very helpful uh, because um, right off the bat, uh, as you said, I think we can see there's gonna be a little bit of an imbalance in our, our training data. And uh, we may wanna think later on about what to do about that. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, that looks great. Definitely. So now on to the fun part. Okay. getting the data ready for get getting the data ready for training now with a lot of other models you might be able to make use of all those different columns and features but for what we're going to be using today spacey we're really only going to need one of these columns um we're going to use the text of the description column to determine whether or not a job posting is fraudulent so we could then set data frame really down to these two columns uh-huh okay yeah. yeah description and yeah whether or not it's fraudulent and one thing i i'm wondering about is are we using the fact that it's fraudulent to figure out if something's fraudulent? That feels like cheating. Uh, so what, what uh, when you say training, what is it that we're doing here? And, and why is it using uh, the fraudulent column, which sounds like the thing we're trying to figure out? Yeah, so as, at a very simplistic level, the computer is looking at the description and trying to learn what features, it's trying to learn the patterns from um, our descriptions mm -hmm. and be able to associate that with being fraudulent or not fraudulent. That's what we mean by training. Um, this is different from you know, other software engineering where we define our patterns first and then the program you know, goes. In machine learning, we have our model and we it tries to learn the patterns and the rules and then it'll be able to apply it to a, a data that it has not seen before. Mm -hmm. I see. So yeah, so then and that 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 makes a lot more sense than as to why we would call it training. Uh, it's allowed to know the answer. It's kind of like having the answers in the back of the book. And, uh, you know, you can work through the problem and maybe see, okay, did I get that right or wrong? Oh, maybe I didn't. Let me look at why. And, uh, and if you do enough of those, you'll start to get things right, because you'll know all the different mistakes uh, that you've made after 17,000 problems. And, uh, uh, and then and then I guess the idea is, we're not really trying to guess if these are fraudulent or not. We already know. But if a new one came along, then we could use everything that we learned from training uh, to, to make a guess about this new thing. That, uh, that, that does make uh, quite a bit of sense. In fact, as a, a very quick aside, um, there's another activity up on the, up on the website uh, on digitalsignature.fm uh, where we do this with, um, with flower species, uh, the, some of the classic data set called the iris data set. And it tells you all about these flower petals and uh, you're actually able to guess and predict uh, what kind of flower something is by looking at how big its petals are, how big its stem is. And you see a new flower and you say, well, that's got this kind of stem and this kind of petal. And that looks like something I've seen before. Um, and that's exactly what, what Adam's doing here. Um, you could probably think about other things in life that, that we do as humans to classify things. Uh, one that comes to my mind is um, if you've ever like reached into your pocket to get money, um, if, if, if you have dollar bills in your pocket, it's really hard to know if you're pulling out a $5 bill or a $1 bill or a $10 bill, because they're all kind of the same. And, uh, but with coins, it's actually pretty easy. You could, you could reach in your pocket and grab a coin and you would know, you would at least know that like it's not a, a US quarter, uh, that maybe it's a penny because of the size and the weight and the thickness. And uh, some of them might be tricky, like is it a penny or is it a dime? But you would definitely know it's not a quarter and you definitely know a nickel because they're, they're pretty unique. And uh, uh, so I think that's what's happening here. We're looking at examples of pennies and examples of quarters. And then later on, we're kind of reaching and closing our eyes and picking up a coin and saying, what is this? Uh, and here we're saying, is this job description real or not based on all these things that I see? Um, so you can head back to our website. We have some other uh, examples there if, if this is interesting to you. Um, uh, where you can dive in and, and do some predictive uh, analytics and uh, and machine learning. That's that's a lot of fun. Um, anyway, I've, I've interrupted you. So uh, where where did we leave off? We were we were pulling out two columns uh, from our data set: uh, the description and uh, whether or not it was fraudulent. Um, and uh, I've seen this drop NA thing before. I guess we're getting rid of the empties, right? Uh, that's what we did earlier. Exactly. And I think with the description column, we were fortunate only to have one. Um, row missing or one value for a description missing. So we didn't really lose a lot of data by doing that, but it'll be better for our learning. And that is the case when you don't have that many uh, missing values, it usually makes sense to just drop them. Or you could do some of the other imputation techniques I mentioned, but for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna drop them. Sounds so good. yeah, so yeah, we can do that. And now we can move on to actually getting the data in the training format that Spacey, our NLP um, library, is going to expect. Okay. So the first thing we do is we're going to create a new column called tuples. And what a tuple is, it's a data structure in Python. You can think 
that is um, like, as you, uh, if you can see actually in the output, because we ended up printing it, you can see those parentheses. So there's two things in those parentheses. There is the description and there is the um, class, whether or not it's fraudulent. So a tuple just puts those two things in, a, in the parentheses. And then we convert that to a list. So we're nearly there getting our data into proper training format. So we basically have a big list now of these tuples of the description and the class, whether or not it's fraudulent. I see. And I, I noticed there was only two, so I checked back up in the code. I see why. Uh, you told it to print out the first two, and I'm, I'm guessing that was so that uh, we didn't overwhelm the screen with 17,000 of these. But in reality, I, I bet there's uh, probably about that many. Um, and uh, yeah, so you're, um, let's see. So you're taking those two columns and kind of like grouping them together. You're, you're saying, let's let's put them into one column uh, where I've got the the uh, um, whether or not it's fraudulent description right next to each other so that we can access them later. So exactly. um, yeah, that's what these parentheses are doing, kind of grouping them together. And yeah, that's uh, called a, a tuple that, that I like. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and I do want to point out that it is usually good practice to print out what you've done. If you've done some sort of processing, you want to make sure that it looks the way you expect it to look. Absolutely. So I only printed out two examples here. I could have printed out more, but this was enough to validate, like, yeah, I got this in the right format. You know what else I noticed, uh, Adam, is uh, and maybe, maybe you're going to talk about this later on, but it, it just kind of jumped out at me. Like, I'm noticing that, like, some of these write-ups are not very consistent. And, I, and as I read that, I thought, well, of course they're not. You know, humans probably made these and uh, people make mistakes. And so there's like a space missing here. And I bet there's some things that are misspelled. And when I was scrolling around, I even saw like these funny things. And uh, you and I happen to know what they are. They're, they're characters like uh, uh, quotation marks or dashes or a little copyright sign, if you've ever seen that, like symbols that aren't letters, they're little codes. And, uh, but they're not English, uh, you know, or, or, or native language uh, text. So, um, you know, what's gonna happen with those? Yeah, so this is another consideration um, a data scientist would have to make whether or not we should be cleaning the data, making it so that we remove those um, mistakes and really try to simplify it and normalize the text. Because like I mentioned before, data is messy, collecting data is messy. There, there is a decision we have to make whether or not we wanna clean it and or not clean it too, because spelling errors and the like might be an indication of a fraudulent job posting. So maybe we don't wanna remove them. Maybe we do really an point. experiment. Yeah, maybe we do yeah. an experiment where we do keep them and an experiment where we don't. That's what you know science is really all about. We will do a couple different experiments and have a hypothesis whether or not that's gonna have an effect on the actual accuracy of the model. That's that's really cool. That's that makes so much sense. That's yeah. great. Thanks. Uh, okay. Yeah. Then uh, let me not uh, let me not keep you there. I'm I'm really glad you uh, uh, you you mentioned that because uh, yeah, my first thought would have been let's absolutely fix that stuff up. But uh, yeah, maybe I'm kind of tampering with the training a little bit there, and uh, you know, putting my putting my thumb on the scale a little bit. So uh, I didn't, didn't think about that. So uh, that's great. Um, okay. Cool. Yeah. So now we can really get ready for the training part itself. So when we have a data set, we, the ideal goal is to split it so that the majority of the data goes to the model to train on. And then we keep a small portion known as the test set for evaluating the model to make sure it's performing at a level that we want it to. So the first thing in those two lines of code that you see is I'm designating a training size. So I'm saying 80% of the data is going to be training. And that split variable is basically me getting the actual number based on the actual size of the data set. So we have 17,000 um, data points. So I'm multiplying that by 0.8. So I'm getting 80% of that. So that's, I guess, like around 15,000 or 14,000. Yeah, okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so another thing that I did down there, and this might not be super important here, is it's usually good to shuffle the data before um, splitting, or, because yeah. sometimes models can learn from the order of a data. And I don't think that'll be a problem here since our data is in order, but this is just good practice, just so that um, if a model 
did learn from the order, it's not going to perform well on data it hasn't seen. It's not going to be able to generalize well. Yeah, that's you know, a good yeah. idea. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so we're kind of uh, making sure the deck's not already sorted uh, before we play the game, you know, and kind of kind of mix it around a little bit, um, just in case you know, the same person wrote the first 10 job postings. We don't, we don't kind of bias our input. And actually I saw something else and I won't ask you about it now, uh, but I, it made me smile that uh, you're, you're seeding the random number generator. And uh, for folks at home, if you're curious about what that is and how that works, uh, we actually have another activity on the website that, uh, that talks about where random numbers come from and uh, uh, what seeds are. So if you're reading this and thinking, oh, I've never heard of that word before, uh, we're going to keep you in suspense today, but uh, you can go check that out. And uh, uh, there's, some, there's some fun stuff uh, over there about that. So uh, uh, yeah, that sounds great. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. And so the final thing we have to do is actually make the split ourselves. So what you see there is we are splitting the data, we're indexing the data. Um, so you can think of split as being that number, that integer. So with that train, we are getting all the data up to that point. So up to the, 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 the split number. Mm -hmm. And for the test, it's all the remaining data. Here, yeah, okay. Exactly. So taking this deck of cards, we're shuffling them up and we're saying, grab the first 80% right off the top. Boom, there it is. And what's left? All your training uh, examples, uh, job descriptions. That sounds good. And that's what this colon is doing here. So we're saying in the data set, uh, all those uh, records of data, all those rows, give me everything from the beginning up to, you can almost read that colon like up to, uh, so for up to split. And here, what are we reading? Well, the colon moves. So we're reading from split up to nothing, but in uh, Python terms, that means the end. So if there's nothing, it either means the beginning or the end. So yeah, we're taking the first 80% and the last 20%. Uh, percent. I know the word split is still there, but we're saying that 80% mark up till the end, there's 20% left. That's great. Yeah. And so moving forward, this is the last step we have to do to actually get um, Oh, you probably didn't run the cell oh, above. Oh, you're yeah. right. I, uh, you're right. <laughs> yeah. So that can be that. one of the tricky things about Jupyter notebooks is you can run code out of order, which yeah. can sometimes mess things up if you set a variable and then you know you have something else listed as the same variable later on, and you do things out of order and you just mess up your whole flow. So that's one of the tricky things about Jupyter notebooks. It makes it good for experimentation, but when you get into the actual production level, you know, you're writing the code that'll write the models. It, it makes sense to switch to another um, uh, interactive development environment. Um, I've, yeah, I, th I don't think that's the actual acronym for ID, but another environment where you can write code in one large file or a collection of files rather than running it in the notebook. But the notebook is good for this initial experiment. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm actually kind of glad I made that mistake. I, I did that uh, by mistake. That was an accident. But uh, I, I'm glad I did it because, yeah, that's easy to do. And uh, because we had kind of preloaded the outputs, uh, almost like a little cooking show, you know, you put the cake in the oven and, well, we're not going to wait two hours for the, the cake. And so there it is. And then, then we'll pull it out. So uh, I actually forgot to hit the run button here, this little play button um, that you would be clicking all the way through. And so because of that, this was the button, uh, the section where we created the data. Uh, and then down here, I was using the data to split off into the 80-20. And I didn't have it because I just forgot to hit that button there. So um, yeah, so it's nice that we've broken this into sections, but um, at home, you'll want to make sure you click on these little uh, buttons uh, along the way, and that will run the code uh, step by step. Uh, thanks for the explanation uh, and for bailing me out there. So uh, I think we're good now. And uh, uh, that gets us our 80-20 uh, training data and testing data. And it uh, looks like we have a, a function down here, a little helper. Uh, what's, what's going on here? Yeah, so Spacey expects um, the data to be in its own format. So what we did up there was get it ready to be converted to Spacey's own specific format oh, okay. called a doc. It's called it's a special object called a document object. So I decided to create a function because we're going to need to do this twice. We're going to need to create a training um, oh. a document and we're going to need to do a test document. So that's what functions are for, right? Don't want to write the same code twice. So there's a little bit going on here. So one thing to know about Spacey is that it creates, um, it's composed of a pipeline. Uh, 
But since we don't, and these pipelines are the components of a spacing pipeline are different machine learning models for different tasks, like named entity recognition, part of speech tagging. We don't need the entire pipeline. What we really need is its tokenizer so that when you see that spacey.blank and um, EN, it stands for English. We're just adding, we're just um, creating this English tokenizer and we're assigning it to that NLP uh, object. I see. What's a tokenizer, by the way? So, yeah. So what a tokenizer is, is something that breaks text into its constituent words and punctuation. So the, for a sentence like the cat goes to the mall, the tokens would be the cat goes and so forth. Like it's breaking it up a sentence or a string up into its constituent parts. Cool. So we're kind of reading these job descriptions uh, one word at a time. Exactly. And it also converts it into Spacey's own token format. So they're no longer strings, the, the words and the text. They become, um, they become Spacey token objects within a Spacey document object. So, and that has some interesting, you know, functionality to it that maybe we could explore later on. But for right now, we have to convert each um, text, each description to its own um, spacey doc and add it to the document object, which holds all the different documents. And then we write it to disk. But if you can see there that doc.cats, um, this is our own component of the pipeline that we're adding to it. We are saying, we are telling it what category this document belongs to, being that it's either fraudulent or not fraudulent. So, uh, yeah, we. Is, and that might be a one, and negative is it's not. So, one minus one would be like a zero. Uh, and uh, and uh, that, that sounds good. Yeah, that's great. And, and by the way, um, if, if, you're, if you're new to natural language processing, which I imagine um, that many of you are, uh, this is a little bit in the weeds. Uh, so, uh, but I, I think uh, Adam's explanation was, is really helpful that we're basically taking all that training and testing job description that we just saw and, and just telling the, um, the, the library that we're using to classify for us, the natural language processor, that, hey, I'm giving you in something called a loop, a for loop. So for every job description and label, if you remember those tuples that Adam created, there were two columns, two parts. Uh, there was the job description and whether or not it was fraudulent. Um, and we can go back up and see that here. Here it is, the job description and whether or not it was fraudulent is a zero or a one. Zero happens to mean not fraudulent, right? Fraudulent, zero, not fraudulent. So what we're saying is for every one of those tuples, for every one of those job descriptions, we're saying go ahead and categorize it, that's the cats, uh, categorize it as the label, that's the zero or the one from the, uh, from the, um, uh, from the tuple. So if it's positive, uh, then we're going to give it a one. And if it's negative, well, we want that to be a zero. So we'll do one minus that. And that'll, uh, that'll give us a, a zero for, for not fraudulent. So we're basically just like creating this file folder, this bucket uh, that we're going to hand to the natural language processor, uh, Spacey. And uh, what we're doing is just saying, go grab all those uh, uh, job descriptions and put them into the, the right bucket uh, so that we can hand it over to the uh, processor. So um, so if this uh, stuff looks a little new and there's some words and, and uh, syntax in here that looks a little uh, unusual, it's just because that's the way the library works and uh, somewhere someone wrote down how it works. So you'd be able to see that. So this isn't necessarily something I assume anyway, Adam, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you'd have to like close your eyes and and, and like see the code, but that there's kind of a pattern in the documentation that would tell you what is a category and, and sort of how do you set this up that you can sort of walk through. Oh yeah, absolutely. Spacey is, um, Spacey has a lot to it and we're only covering a small section of its capabilities, but yeah, like the beautiful thing is it's very easy and we'll see later on how training a model with Spacey. But Spacey really is an amazing library that can be used for a bunch of different NLP tasks. And there's a little bit of a, a learning curve to it. But Spacey is great because if you go, they have amazing documentation in their own interactive um, course on their website. Um, so it's very easy to pick up because they make it, you know, so great and accessible. That's cool. That's great. Yeah. 
So moving on to that last little bit of the function, we are writing those um, oh, here those documents. Yeah, we're writing those documents to a file. Mm -hmm. um, and we and those are the files that we're going to be using to train our model. We didn't have to return the document object, but if you want to um, work with it in the in the training notebook after running that function, you can explore the documents a little and what actually a spacey document looks like as opposed to the text that we saw beforehand. Like what kind of features does the, a, a spacey document have versus um, just a string, which is the, um, the data structure it was in before. Gotcha. But yeah, so we created the training in the test set and you can see that on, well, we're gonna have to run that. And then it should populate on the left. And actually, yeah, it should be in our folder too. Right, um, it's going to show up over here because we're saving it. And, yeah. and I'm thinking that there's going to be two, right? There's going to be a, a train and a test. Exactly. So it takes a little bit because we're going through 17,000 documents. Right. Look at that. That wasn't so bad. So 14,000 of them, that's the first 80%. Uh, that uh, took about 30 seconds. So I bet the second one will be much faster because uh, uh, it's only about 20%. So it was 30 seconds to do 80%. Um, it's probably like uh, maybe 10 seconds to do the rest. And, uh, and sure enough, there it was. I think that was about 14 seconds. So uh, there we go. Uh, so we've got our train and our test and did the files appear over here. Uh, well, I don't so see them yet but I bet I can right click here and click refresh. And uh, there they are. Uh, there there they you are. go. Okay. Uh, will I see anything meaningful if I if I open these? I, I wonder if uh, boy, that wasn't a mistake. No, there's gonna be a lot of a junk in there. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah, they're not gonna be very readable. It did download, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll spare you the suspense uh, that uh, yeah, it's uh, not gonna be human readable uh, data. It's meant for the machine. So, um, so it's good enough just to have them there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So now we can get on to the actual fun stuff. So as you can see, again, we're going to be interacting with Spacey's command line interface. That's what that exclamation point does, right. rather than writing the code in the file. This is, um, for Spacey version 3, this is the developer recommended way to create our, our models. Um, so that first cell is the configuration file. This tells Spacey um, the hyperparameters, meaning what, how it should learn, um, with what architectures it should learn with. And um, it's basically the source of truth for all model training. That's how the model is trained. It reads from that configuration file and those are the parameters it uses to, to learn. And that second cell is actually how we set up the learning process. So it, it, the nice thing about using this command line interface is it kind of abstracts all the intricacies of model training itself. We don't really see what's going on under the hood, but we get this visual output, which is really nice. So you can see it's setting up a, pipe, a pipeline. And what it is trying to do is train that text cat um, component, which you can see in that, um, on that second row where it says pipeline. And so we're only training one component, but you can really train as many as you want in tandem. Um, and then we can see in the actual training output, which you see it's gonna start doing, nice. is we're gonna see the loss, we're gonna see this, and we're gonna see the score. And cat score and score are gonna be the same thing here because we're only doing, um, we're only training one component, but um, yeah. So what is a loss and a score? What, what, uh, I got us a head start. I started running that as quickly as I could because uh, I had a feeling that was gonna take a little bit um, and it is still running, but uh, while we're waiting for it, uh, yeah, what, what, do some of these, what do some of these things mean? Oh, I see some, uh, we're already getting some results. That's, that's very good. Yeah, so you can think of the score as accuracy. Um, how, so you can see in the syntax of that model training, the, the code that you um, wrote, we are, the model is being trained on the test set and then, or it's being trained on the training set and then it's being evaluated at each training um, epic. It's that's that E there in that uh, training oh. output. Okay. So it's being evaluated and it, it's seeing how close it is actually to the actual um, 
to the, the deficit, how much it predicted correctly. So that loss, we want to minimize that loss. If it has the larger the loss, the means the further away it is from being as um, as accurate as the as the deficit. I see. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I wondered. I was going to ask you about why we um, why we uh, gave the testing set uh, the fraudulent column. I, I, I noticed that we we added that column to the testing set. And so it's it's because of this we're 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 not looking at it the the space we're gonna have to trust Spacey on this but it's not looking at the answer it's predicting as if it didn't know and it saw those testing files as twenty percent for the very first time it makes its prediction and then just like those answers in the back of the book it then goes back and says hey did I get that right and every time it makes a mistake that's going to be some of that loss and it's going to adjust and fine tune the way that it's learning and the patterns that it's looking for. And then it's going to try again and try again and try again and try again. And so we're seeing that's why these are numbered 200 tries, 400 tries, 600 tries. Um, and uh, as it as it goes, in theory, it should kind of generally get better, you would hope. But, you know, it's a it's a computer and it doesn't necessarily know how to think about these things. Uh, and so, in fact, sometimes you see it, you know, it did a little better here, but then it gets a little worse. Um, well, that's all information that the, the classifier can use and say, well, I made more mistakes there than I had before. How can I synthesize those together? And hopefully we'll do the best that we'll do uh, by the time we get to the end. What I do notice is on the right, that score you mentioned, the um, accuracy, uh, that is uh, going up, even though our loss uh, might have been moving around a little bit there. So uh, there, now we're, now we're starting to, uh, now we're starting to uh, uh, converge a little bit. Um, so we'll see, uh, you know, what kind of accuracy we end up with uh, at the end. So this score is telling us, is that a percentage, 66% uh, of the 20% that it's getting right? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Um, how long do you think we have to let this run? <laughs> so I set that, and you can see that parameter in the code, that it's only going to go for one epic. Oh, cool. right. So it's it should be finished pretty soon, but we can stop training at any time, and we'll have a, the best model from the training available. So you can click this um, the square stop button if you want, or we can let it go for a little bit longer. I, I would imagine it would take probably close to 10 minutes to okay. finish one. So that might be a little bit too long, but we do have a model now that's ready to be evaluated okay. if we were to. I'll admit I was, I was being a little facetious when I said that, uh, but this does seem like a good spot to let it go. Uh, and, and, and the idea is uh, that uh, if, if we stop it later, it'll have more chances to improve itself. Uh, but we could just stop it now and stick with what we've got. So um, yeah, so that's uh, kind of a decision that we can make. And in practice, we would let this thing run overnight or for days. We wouldn't sit here watching it. Uh, but uh, since we're uh, since we're sort of uh, uh, live here, so to speak, um, this does seem like a good spot to me. And uh, you know, we're getting reasonable performance here. Uh, we'll go ahead and cut it off right there. There we go. And it says I aborted, uh, but it will remember, as Adam told us, uh, the most recent uh, epic, uh, the most recent uh, round that it had done. Uh, so that's uh, that's very good. So if you let it run longer, you might do a little bit better. Uh, and uh, that sounds good. OK. So we've got our model now, right? I, I think I saw a new file appear over here somewhere. Did it actually write all that stuff out somewhere? Should be um, to the output file that you see in the I, left. Uh, that appeared. I know. I knew there was something that wasn't there before. So right. So it's got the most recent uh, uh, modeling information. Again, this isn't necessarily going to be human uh, readable. Some of it is, um, and uh, but it also remembers the best that it did up until that point. Well, that seems like a good idea. Um, so in case you got worse uh, over time, you can kind of go back. So um, okay. So we've got all this data about how we learned. Um, and uh, so now uh, is that it? Like well, I see, there's a step left. So what's what's left? So the last thing that we're going to want to do is see if our model is actually capable of predicting um, these fraudulent job postings with accuracy at a threshold that we specify. Like we want to know if it's good enough for our standards. So we need to evaluate it. And that's why we split off that little test set so we could see how accurate it is. So running that code, Spacey is going to do its own little magic to evaluate, to get some of the most important metrics. And since we're doing a classification problem, there are several metrics that we're going to want to consider. One being the precision, um, recall, and F1 score. So talking a little bit about those, um, precision, and you can see that in the middle column, we have the precision, recall, and F1 of both the positive class, meaning the fraudulent class, 
and the negative class, meaning the legitimate class. So the precision is um, how good the model is at um, not predicting false positives, distinguishing true from false positives, false positive being a, um, a fraudulent when it actually is legitimate. So how good at the model is the model and not predicting those um, instances? Oh, right. Because if you get the, the answer wrong, it's, it, it is a little different to say that I got it wrong by guessing true when it was false versus I got it wrong by guessing false when it was true. I, I, we talk about this a lot, like when we look at uh, weather reports on TV that like I could, I could predict the weather by telling you that it's gonna rain every day. And I would never be wrong because you would never be caught without an umbrella when you needed one. So, well, at least you're prepared, right? But uh, I'm not really studying anything about the climate uh, to tell you that. I'm just waking up every day and telling you that it's gonna rain. So um, yeah, maybe there's a difference between those errors. That's a, that's a great point. Um, uh, go on, yeah. Yeah, so getting into the recall, an easy way to think about it is it's similar to precision, except instead of caring about whether or not the model classifies false positives well, we care if it classifies false negatives well, mm -hmm. meaning did it um, predict a fraudulent job posting was legitimate? Um, that's something we might care about. And then the F1 score, the F at the end, is really a, a, a mix between the two. If we don't really care about one precision or recall more than the other, we might want to see combine them and see have an overall score to consider, which is why you can see that they're somewhat in between the precision and the recall. Right. You know, what's interesting to me, I'm looking at how we did, and... Uh, for, for getting the non-fraudulent ones, we, we do pretty well. That, that looks pretty good to me. Uh, but uh, we start to have a little bit of trouble when it comes to the positive cases, um, the ones that are uh, fraudulent. Uh, and uh, why, uh, why do you think, uh, and I, I, I'm tongue in cheek because I, I think you know, but uh, tell us why that is. So if we remember from our exploratory data analysis phase, what we really saw was a huge imbalance between the fraudulent and the non-fraudulent class. So given that the model didn't see as many fraudulent um, examples, it's, it is likely that it really wasn't able to learn as well what makes a fraudulent class, but it learned pretty well at, at what could you know, not be fraudulent. Right. But the problem with that is it might be more likely now to classify um, a description or a job posting as not fraudulent because that's what it knows. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I guess that leads us to some some questions. Uh, and actually for, for those following the activity, sorry for scrolling on you, but uh, um, what uh, are some, some maybe things that uh, you could think about uh, um, when you're finished here and, and maybe talk about as a group. Um, and, and one of them was, uh, you know, for us, our model didn't actually do so great. I mean, in some ways it did, but uh, not everything. And, and uh, uh, in fact, that's the first question here we, we posed is, uh, why do you think that is? And uh, yeah, it sure sounds like it's that imbalance of the uh, training examples between uh, what's fraudulent and what's not fraudulent. We didn't give it enough fraudulent examples uh, to find patterns on. And uh, so there's a, there's a couple of ways that we could deal with that. One of them is go find more fraudulent examples, but maybe you don't have them. Uh, and so, uh, so a question maybe that we would pose to the audience is, um, what would you do instead? What else could you do? And, uh, you, can, you can reply in the comments uh, or uh, send us a note and uh, tell us what you think, and uh, we'll have a conversation there about that. But um, that's something to think about. Um, what are some other uh, things here? I see we have a couple other uh, food for thought uh, ideas here, um, if you're able to see them okay. Uh, what, what else uh, do you think we could talk about? Yeah, so one thing we want to be able to do is rationalize why a model made the predictions that it did. And we have tools to do that. So in that second question, identifying key features, we can use Spacey to find the entities within the text. And we can see if there's some sort of pattern there that we can um, see that maybe that the, mach uh, the machine learning model picked up on too. Are there certain words or phrases that appear more in fraudulent job postings? We can find that for ourselves because one important thing we um, about machine learning 
it, it, in machine learning is model explainability. We want to be able to rationalize why our model made the decisions that it did. So if there are ways that we can um, go about that, it makes for a one, us having faith in the model, and two, if we're going to be putting this model in a business setting, we want our customers or whoever we're um, trying to help have faith in the model as well. So being able to do, uh, for our um, example here, identifying any words or phrases that might be frequent in these um, descriptions, it might give us some insight into how the model is making its decisions. Right, that's cool. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and I see here something about that exploratory phase uh, where you were visualizing some of that data. So um, uh, the, the idea here is, um, you know, looking at how many fraudulent versus non-fraudulent items there were, that's one way you can explore the data. Uh, but I imagine there are others. And you gave us some examples here, like uh, words that appear the most often across those job descriptions uh, or even within a job description. What are some other good visualizations that you could do that would help you get an idea about what the data is? You're almost trying to find some of the patterns yourself as a human, I think, uh, so that you can better tell the computer what columns to go grab and, and learn on as well. So um, are there other uh, 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 good um, exploratory steps that you tend to take for a, a general problem? Yeah, so with uh, numerical data anyway, we could go back to talking about like descriptive statistics, getting a sense of um, mm -hmm. is there, well, we saw that there wasn't much in terms of salary ranges. That was one of the more frequent, um, not available null values. But we could see, is there, you know, what is the mean, median, and mode? Does this tie to um, fraudulent job descriptions? Are fraudulent job descriptions one that tend to have higher pay? Um, is that um, to entice people to apply for them, or is it the uh, or is it the other way? Are they do they have generally on average have lower pay? These are so, sort of the things we're looking for. Things that are um, simple and easily deliverable information. Something that we can look on its face, not have to go through the whole text itself and be able to say to make a general statement about the data right that's cool yeah yeah it's it's interesting to me this step here is probably one of the most important ones and it's uh it's really a human step it's uh you know there's there's a lot of um you know probably not a ton of programming but more critical thinking and experimentation and making hypotheses and asking good questions and thinking critically about the data like what story is it telling me and how maybe is it misleading me you know that oh it sure looks like that all the ones that post salaries are fraudulent and like ah, that might not be true and uh, um, you know being able to kind of really scrutinize what you're looking at is a um, is a is a real skill but you're you know it's not something you're going to learn uh, by um, you know uh, in a programming class per se as much as it's helpful to have that um, it's uh, it's it's really about uh, thinking a little bit like a detective and, and asking good, interesting questions. And um, these are things that, that, that we can all do. Um, and uh, that, that I think is really exciting. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, that's so cool. Uh, well, Adam, we did it. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing this and for putting this together for us. Um, and so you can find this and more at, uh, at digitalsignature.fm. Uh, and uh, please check it out. And, and if you do, um, let's consider this a, a big living document. Uh, if you want to uh, make suggestions or revisions or you use it in your class or at home and you have ideas, um, send them back to us and we'll include them here. Uh, and uh, you can uh, keep in touch with us through the comments here. Uh, and uh, we hope you'll do that. And uh, um, we're, we're just here to, here to help and uh, here to share. And uh, uh, I think Adam has, has provided us a great example of that and I'm, I'm really grateful for it. So uh, thanks again, uh, Adam, for being here and for doing all this. Absolutely, I'm happy to help. Yeah, thanks so much. This was really great. And uh, uh, so, yeah, hopefully uh, you've all enjoyed this. Uh, do keep in touch with us. Uh, send us your, your ideas, your comments, your thoughts, how to go for you. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again uh, real soon on the next episode. See you soon. Bye.